mask off. It's great to be here. Thanks so much, and thanks to the committee for asking me to be here, and colleagues that I haven't seen in a while in here, so it's, it's good to be here. So um, I'm here to talk about what's new in cardiology. Um, I'll uh, go through a few trials that have been released in the last year, year and a half, and then certainly want to leave a bunch of time in case you guys have any questions um, about what's new in cardiology, so happy to answer it. My disclosure slides, uh, again, my objectives are we're going to talk a little bit about primary and secondary prevention in um, chronic ischemic heart disease. Probably the most likely thing that you are to encounter both as a primary care physician as well as a specialist in another um, specialty when you're dealing with a cardiology patient. And then a little bit about some drugs that uh, why I decided not to recertify this year to be my 10 year recertification for internal medicine. Didn't want to do it because I didn't want to do endocrine, but it turns out all the drugs now are endocrine. So I'm, I'm having to learn it anyway. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about COVID. Is it bad for the heart? Here's a little spoiler. It is. And um, luckily, we're early on in the conference, so you guys haven't heard the word COVID too often yet. Um, so I'm lucky that I get to bring it up first. Uh, and then a few future directions and, and some fun things in cardiology. All right, so let's talk about stable coronary artery disease. Um, stable coronary disease really got a lot of attention back in 2007 with this trial called COURAGE. Um, and the COURAGE trial uh, was a trial in which they took patients who had risk factors for coronary disease and they had angina. They said, ouch, it hurts when I go get the mail. And they were actually then uh, randomized after angiography. That's the important thing to remember about COURAGE that a lot of people forget is everyone got cathed. And it was actually on the table that they were then randomized. On the table, if they had at least one or two arteries, but not three, at 70% blocked, uh, only angiographically uh, assessed, um, then they got uh, enrolled. And they were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to either medical therapy or stents. And then they were followed for up to five years, and we've had now uh, even longer follow-up from Courage. And we looked at MACE events. And what did this show? Well, it showed that there was no statistical difference in endpoints when you compared medical therapy to stenting therapy. Uh, and it's true for a lot of the secondary endpoints as well. So this created a lot of waves in the world of cardiology because you had all the preventive cardiologists and all of the primary care doctors saying, see, medical therapy is just as good at stents. And every interventionalist said, no, it's not. And the reason we said, no, it's not, was because of this, and that is the crossover rate. So a third of the patients that randomized to medical therapy in the first year got stented anyway because they failed medical therapy. Um, and a third, even though we get a lot of crossover rate uh, in cardiology trials, a third is a lot. And it's an intention to treat analysis, right, to remove bias from these studies. So if you randomize to the medical arm and three months later you got stented, your data endpoints were still in the medical arm even though you got stented. It was not an as treated, it was an intention to treat trial. And with that high of a crossover rate, the interventionalist just said, oh, the heck with it. Um, and it really started a lot of conversations around a trial that was uh, announced at the very end of 2019, probably would have got more literature or even more um, press behind it, except COVID hit very quickly after that, and that's the ischemia trial. The ischemia trial was supposed to be the trial that ended all conversations here. The problem was is it was really hard to design, it was really hard to do, and it was really expensive. And it was funded by the National Heart and Lung and Blood Foundation. It was not industry sponsored. They even had to change the adjudicated endpoint halfway through the trial to just increase enrollment. So what was supposed to be you know, five years or so after um, Courage, we were going to get this result. It was 12 years uh, because it took so long to enroll. So what did ischemia do? Ischemia took it a step further, and it said if the endpoints in a patient who gets cathed is the same, why don't we take it a step before that and see if we can do something non-invasively? So they took stable patients. Um, who uh, were then uh, blinded uh, coronary calcium score to eliminate left main patients. So you enrolled in the trial, you got a free blinded coronary CT angiogram that said, nope, you don't have left main disease, you can enroll in the trial. Or it said, sure enough, you've got left main disease and you got kicked out of the trial and you got cath and appropriate care. Um, or if you had really bad kidney function, there was a subset called the ischemia CKD trial that enrolled patients who didn't get their blinded C, um, CCTA. 
And then they randomized these patients after they were found to have ischemia on a non-invasive test. About 90, 95% of that was nuclear stress testing. The other five or 10% was stress echo or some other modality, but most of it was nuclear stress testing that actually got them enrolled in the first place. And they had to have ischemia on that. The reason that we did that was because Courage did a sub-study of nuclear stress testing in a small percentage of patients that said if you had more than a 10% ischemic burden on a nuclear stress test, you were more likely to benefit from intervention and less likely to benefit from medical therapy. So again, that's really was the premise behind ischemia. You had to have a stress test, it had to be abnormal for you even to enroll. So if you did a nuclear stress test and you had 0% ischemic burden, you were never even enrolled in the trial. Okay, so these are patients who we documented ischemia. That was really actually the request from the interventionalist because the interventionalist said, courage doesn't really mean anything to us because we only stent patients who are ischemic, truly ischemic. Well, always is a tough word in interventional cardiology. Uh, but it, basically, that, that's really where that came from. And again, they were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to say, okay, you enrolled in the invasive management strategy, you have 12% ischemic burden on a nuclear stress test, you're going to the cath lab and we're stenting you and putting you on a regimen of medicines, or you randomized into the medical arm. Obviously, this could not be blinded. We didn't do sham procedures in these patients. They, they were uh, unblinded to which strategy they got. Um, and it turns out that this was also a trial that showed a non-significant difference between the two groups. If you look here on the chart, at six months, there was actually um, a higher numerically, but not statistically, rate of MACE events, which was CV death, MIs, hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, or uh, sudden cardiac death. There was actually a higher numerical number in the cath patients because you went to the lab, right? We stick wires in your coronaries. You tend to make a few mistakes here and there. But if you then look at four years, there was actually a numerical superiority to the invasive strategy, but the entire trial, which was about four, uh, four and a half years in terms of follow-up for most patients, uh, there was no statistically significant difference between the conservative management strategy and the invasive management strategy. I can tell you that this was supposed to be groundbreaking in the world of cardiology. It actually wasn't because 95% of interventionalists said, look, we're already trying to do this in a really good way. We know that we are being looked at for our stent utilization, so we want to prove ischemic uh, burden before we ever stent a patient, either non-invasively or invasively in the cath lab with flow reserve wires. Where I think ischemia actually has the most benefit is actually in our primary care providers because you can safely treat a patient medically. Let's say that you have a patient who has an abnormal nuclear stress test with 8% ischemic burden that really isn't on meds. You can feel comfortable that by placing them on a statin and a beta blocker while you're awaiting a cardiology consult a month from now that you're not killing people. And I think that's really important. Uh, and it's important to tell patients that, that by treating you with medicines, we're not giving you anything inferior to what, let's say, someone who gets a stent. That's a hard thing to convince a patient of. I get it. Um, and uh, Bill Bowden, who was the senior author on the Courage trial, he came to the university when I was a fellow and spoke about Courage. And one of my attendings raised his hand. And he said, so, Bill, if you had a 90% proximal LAD blockage, you want me to just treat you medically? And he said, heck no, get me a stent. Um, so I think that it's hard to convince patients that they can be treated medically. But again, ischemia should give you that confidence. All right. The next is in aspirin use. So should I be recommending aspirin for my patients is a really good question that you guys and we get asked all the time. 20 or 30 years ago, it was you know practically put in the water. Um, and the pendulum has swung in multiple different uh, directions, especially over the last couple of years. I think the most important thing when you're deciding whether or not to place a patient on aspirin therapy is do they have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or ASCVD, this new catchphrase we've now been using for the last five or 10 years. I think it's really important that you answer this question first because if they do not have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, they've never been stented or any other revascularization procedure like cabbage, they don't have carotid stenosis, they ha don't have uh, symptomatic peripheral vascular disease, there is very limited role for an antiplatelet uh, agent, especially aspirin, in that. Two large studies that came out of Europe in the last couple of years proved that, that even in a high-risk population like diabetics, 
for primary prevention, there is very little role for, uh, for an aspirin therapy. I, I have probably in the last year placed two, maybe three patients uh, for primary prevention on aspirin therapy. And both of them had high cardiovascular burden of atherosclerotic disease based on a coronary CTA that was asymptomatic and a strong family history of events. They are about the only patients I put on uh, aspirin anymore. So, uh, but if they have atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, they've been revascularized uh, previously, they absolutely should be on an antiplatelet agent. Um, but the question is which one and how much? We've never really randomized this uh, to any great degree. We've looked at it retrospectively, we've looked at it in registry data, but never in a randomized fashion. And this year we, uh, there was a trial called the ADAPTABLE trial which randomized patients with known atherosclerotic ca cardiovascular disease who came into the trial not on an antiplatelet agent. And they actually did get randomized to either 81 milligrams of aspirin or 325. Historically, and based on our newest antiplatelet guidelines, we in cardiology have only advocated for 81 milligram dosing, thinking that the 325 milligram dosing is bad. That uh, sentiment is actually based on, again, registry data and uh, as well as retrospective data from historical trials when we used to randomize aspirin dosing that said 325 was worse than 81, but we never really prospectively randomized that. And again, Adaptable did that. And it randomized people, again, between 81 milligram dosing and 325. And what we found is that they are equivalent, okay? So what that really, and, and we thought that we'd see more bleeds and we didn't see more bleeds. So what are the take-home messages from Adaptable? The take-home messages are if you're not on aspirin therapy and you've had an atherosclerotic event, you should start aspirin therapy in that patient. And you should start them on 81 milligrams. But if a patient is already on 325 milligrams and, they're, and you're concerned by trying to switch them, they're going to stop their medicine because in this country, the 81 milligrams are more expensive than the 325s. Exactly, right? Um, so if you go to Costco right now, you can buy a bucket of 325s for about half the price of 81 milligrams, okay? And before, we've always been concerned about that, or we try to get through the VA, or we try to get their prescription uh, drug coverage to cover it, and a lot of times it wouldn't. I would say adaptable makes me feel comfortable not switching a patient off of their 325 if they don't have any bleeding risk and they're tolerating it well, and they've got an iron gut, and it doesn't bug them, I think that it's completely fine based on this trial result to keep them on it. It's way better than asking them to switch it. It costs them $100 more per year, and they go off of it. That's adaptable. More importantly, I would say, is this trial, um, and that's about de-escalation of antiplatelet therapy. Really, the, the background of this happened, so our drug-eluting stents, the cipher and taxa stents, the very first ones, uh, became adults this year. They are now 18 years old. That's when those trials very first came out. We're now on our fourth generation of drug-eluting stents, but the very first drug-eluting stents were the greatest thing since sliced bread until four years after the original trials in 2006, we found a new concept that we call late stent thrombosis. And that was a stent that never completely epithelialized in a coronary, and then you developed clot when you came off of your dual antiplatelet therapy. It was a victim of the very first drug-looting stents that were more powerful than our current ones. And so everyone who has a taxa stent, for instance, should be on dual antiplatelet therapy forever. Cardiologists, unfortunately, extrapolated that to a lot of patients, and a lot of patients get left on their dual antiplatelet therapy. What we're finding in the last 10 years is that bleeding is probably the worst thing that you can have happen when it comes to morbidity and mortality. In fact, you would rather have a reinfarction six months after a heart attack than a bleed that hospitalizes you if you look at the risk ratio of mortality. So bleeding is a big deal and we need to decrease it. And all of the trials recently have been in minimizing dual antiplatelet therapy as well as anticoagulation. In fact, both of the major stents that we use uh, manufactured today uh, in the last two years have both done a one month dual antiplatelet uh, trial in patients who had MIs at very high risk for bleeding and rather doing the typical 12 months of DAPT, a single month of DAPT, and showing no difference in ischemic outcomes and a marked decrease in bleeding outcomes. So how do we de-escalate antiplatelet therapy? That's the key nowadays is de-escalating it.
Well, we didn't have any large randomized trials in, in this, except a lot of observational and retrospective trials. What we've been doing the last few years, most of us in cardiology, when someone is done with their dual antiplatelet therapy, either a year after an MI or six months after an elective stent, we're taking one of the antiplatelets away. And most of us in cardiology have been taking away the aspirin and leaving patients on their P2Y12. And in this scenario, it's really on Plavix. Okay, or clopidogrel. So we're leaving them on clopidogrel long term. We're taking them off of their aspirin. And again, that's always been based on observational data. And we hadn't had a randomized trial until this year with HOST. And HOST was um, 5,000 patients randomized in Korea after they had their index PCI and they waited that six or 12 months, depending on uh, why they got stented. They then were randomized in a placebo and blinded fashion to either aspirin alone or clopidogrel alone. And then we looked at primary endpoints. And sure enough, it uh, actually it, it confirmed what we've all been doing now for, uh, or a lot of us have been doing, is that it is superior to leave the patient on their clopidogrel or their P2Y12 and come off of the aspirin. This is the overall primary endpoint showing about a 2% absolute risk reduction when you um, keep someone on the clopidogrel rather than on the aspirin. And a number needed to treat of 50 is a really good number in cardiology. Remember, we put in about uh, two, uh, 2 million patients get stented every year. So if 2 million patients had their uh, antiplatelet therapy de-escalated uh, to uh, clopidogrel instead of aspirin, you're looking at 40,000 less primary events in a single year alone in this country. And this isn't just driven by thrombotic or bleeding events. It's actually driven by both. In other words, clopidogrel was both superior to prevent less thrombotic events, meaning less heart attacks and strokes compared to aspirin, and less bleeding than aspirin, something that maybe we didn't expect, but it actually drives both endpoints. So I think that host uh, exam really adds to the literature, especially on how to treat these patients on de-escalation of their antiplatelet therapy. All right. So cardiologists is endocrinologists. So here's a tubule. You can't have a lecture without a tubule, right? Um, and there's a receptor in the proximal tubule called the SGLT2 that helps reabsorb glucose. And when we inhibit it, um, then glucose ends up in our urine and we pee it out. And these are the Flosins, uh, these drugs. There's four of them. I only put three of them up because the fourth one actually does not have near the cardiovascular or renal outcome benefits as these three drugs do. The middle one there, the um, Epegliflosin, um, uh, Jardians is the brand name for that drug. Uh, it has the best and most widespread data when it comes to both cardiovascular endpoints as well as renal endpoints. These drugs are, uh, they're diuretics. Um, they have forced diuresis, and so when you look in a, uh, a heart failure population, whether they have res re, um, reduced or preserved EF, uh, and whether you look in a diabetic population or not, these drugs produce cardiovascular benefits to a pretty great statistical benefit. We don't have drugs in the last 10 or 15 years that, that they all pale in comparison to these drugs. Uh, our heart failure uh, group at McKay, for instance, has sort of become experts on uh, prescribing these. There's actually a white paper in the Journal of American College of Cardiology last year on how a cardiologist should prescribe these medicines. Um, and you're going to see them prescribe more and more, I think, across the board. Nephrologists, endocrinologists, primary care docs, diabetologists, and cardiologists are all going to be prescribing these medicines. And it's all because they actually work. Um, they decrease vascular inflammation. They increase diuresis. And yeah, you get your hemoglobin A1C to come down. But who cares, right? <laughs> That's really what uh, I, I know. Everyone's like, well, who cares? What? Um, no, but from my standpoint, we want to prevent heart attacks. We want to prevent strokes. We want to prevent hospitalizations. And these drugs do that. Um, and so you're going to see them more and more. In fact, where I anticipate the future of this going is actually a lot more collaboration between primary care doctors and cardiologists on getting patients on these medicines earlier and then watching for the potential side effects. The, again, the white paper uh, that was in JAK last year said you're on metformin and then the next drug is one of these, period. And if you're on another oral agent that's uh, in addition to metformin and it's not one of these, you switch them. Uh, it was that uh, uh, strong of a recommendation. All right. COVID in the heart. 
All right, so um, cardiac involvement, uh, we recognize this very early on in the pandemic. In March and April, there were papers published on if you have positive troponins and or a drop in EF when you're admitted to the hospital with COVID, you are probably going to die, um, especially if you're intubated in an ICU. Uh, and the data was very strongly supportive of that in our older population. 10 to 20% of hospitalized COVID patients will have a positive troponin. Um, it is absolutely a cardiotoxic virus, um, and it has been unequivocally tested and studied. We even know that in asymptomatic patients or in patients who were not hospitalized that there is cardiac involvement. Last uh, fall in Germany, in a trial that they did in uh, November to December, they looked at, I think, 60 consecutive patients who were otherwise healthy, not hospitalized with COVID, and they did cardiac MRIs 30 days out, and 37% of those patients had cardiac involvement on a cardiac MRI uh, showing inflammation of the heart. So COVID absolutely affects the heart. Um, the secondary to avoidance of care, as well as our closures that we initiated nationwide and worldwide in the spring of 2020, we saw an increased uh, uh, um, uh, census with unvaccinated COVID and ACS morbidity and mortality all went up. The STEMIs went away. STEMIs should not have gone away. STEMI volume for two and a half months went down by as much as 50% in some places in the, uh, in the nation. That means people were at home having their heart attacks and or they were presenting really late with them. I saw several complications in that six month time period and still uh, even now that I only read about as a fellow. Um, RV free wall ruptures, uh, ruptured papillary wall muscles, um, things that again used to happen pre revascularization days and that you'd maybe see once every five years. I had three in six months. I watched a patient in front of me on the telemetry unit die right in front of me when he ruptured a papillary muscle while I was talking to him in the room uh, because he presented four days late because he had COVID. He had COVID, he was recovering, he had chest pain, thought it was COVID, and then shows up four days later with heart failure symptoms, couldn't revascularize his circumflex, and he had scar formation and ruptured a pap muscle. And this we've seen across the nation. So there's no CV intervention that has shown uh, reduction in hospitalizations or death compared to COVID vaccination, meaning I don't have a stent, I don't have a valve, I don't have ECMO or impeller, all these fancy things I can do. All of them pale in terms of relative risk reduction compared to what vaccination can do from a cardiac standpoint uh, to actually reduce uh, the risk to patients. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the risk of myocarditis and mRNA vaccination. I know that's a hot topic right now. Currently, we've only been able to note that in a non-causal fashion in patients who are male age 16 to 39, though the FDA and the CDC as well as our own societies have suggested that it almost certainly is a causal form of myocarditis. We've only seen it in that causal relationship with the second dose of mRNA vaccines. We have not noted it with the AstraZeneca vaccine nor the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, though I anticipate with Johnson & Johnson applying for a second dose booster now, we may see it with them. However, its mechanism of action, as you all know, is different. So I don't know if we will or not. So it's only associated with the mRNA. The very first risk estimates that came out in that age group was that it was a 1 in 100,000 to 1 in 50,000. A new paper out of Canada was just published that says the actual clinical outcome is probably 1 in 10,000. And if you truly tested every single person two weeks after they got their second mRNA vaccine and you measured a troponin level, probably one in a thousand might have an abnormal troponin level. But clinically significant myocarditis that lands someone in the hospital is somewhere between one in 10,000 and one in 5,000. But remember, 20% of natural COVID has myocardial involvement. So you're choosing between a one in 10,000 risk or a one in five risk of developing some degree of myocardial involvement when you're comparing natural COVID to uh, COVID vaccination. The um, uh, American College of Cardiology, as well as all the major cardiovascular societies made a statement. Again, this is not me making a statement. This is a, a statement uh, that was made on July 30th that the cardiovascular community supports and encourages healthcare systems to require COVID-19 vaccinations for healthcare and long-term care employees to reduce the risk of morbidity and mortality for cardiac patients associated with COVID. And that's what their statement was. All right, new technologies. 
um, and what cardiology maybe can offer here in the last couple of minutes. Um, all levels of risk are now available for transcatheter aortic valve replacement or TAVR, meaning you don't just have to be at high risk. As of two years ago, we can uh, offer that uh, service all the way down to low risk patients. I've been uh, lucky enough to help lead our team up at McKay since 2016 for our TAVR program and have successfully implanted over 300 valves um, and uh, really love that procedure and it's a, a great procedure for now, all levels of risk. We're expanding our transcatheter availability both in the mitral position as well as all of our heart valves of looking at transcatheter options rather than open heart surgery for all of those. And then expanding left atrial appendage closure for secondary stroke prevention in AFib patients. Lastly, in electrophysiology, um, there's been more and more trials in the last two years showing the benefits of early ablative therapy rather than waiting years and years of having a patient stay in AFib, moving forward with ablative therapy early on. Lastly, what's the future for cardiology? This is coming from me uh, as a cardiologist, not any of our societies, but just what I think is on the horizon. I think you're going to see an expanded use of PCSK9 inhibitors, both for secondary and uh, primary prevention for hyperlipidemia. These medicines are great. Um, they're just too expensive. Two of them are currently FDA approved. We anticipate the third being FDA approved. The third one's cool because it's going to be one shot every six months to reduce your LDL cholesterol by 60 or 70%. What you're gonna see over the next decade is us driving down LDLs as low as humanly possible, while we also take care of vascular infl inflammation. If the, if the substrate is not there, you can't put plaque in your arteries. And uh, there's no reason that we won't have goals of driving LDL cholesterols down to 10, 20, or 30. Um, increased use of, again, transcatheter interventions in valvular heart disease. You're gonna see randomized trials come out for PFO closure and migraine. I'm one of the few docs left that actually closes PFOs, but it is not for migraines. Um, unfortunately, especially in this state, too many people got closed for this indication and still get closed for this indication. It is not indicated. But the good news is we're actually doing trials because there is probably five to 10% of migraine sufferers that will probably benefit from closure. It's finding out who that patient is that's important. So uh, anticipate trials in the next few years in that. Um, and then as, as well as the role of long COVID syndrome and the heart. Uh, we just got a grant through, Intermountain Healthcare just got a grant through the NIH of about $4 million to study long COVID uh, in, uh, and, and its heart complications, so anticipate that. That's all I got. Questions? We don't know yet. It's still too early to know because all we have is really the Pfizer trial in the 16 to, or the, the 12 to 18 year olds that was a secondary trial after their original trials. And the number or the N is not large enough to necessarily show a decrement because as you noted, the risk is still really low, right? Luckily. Thank goodness that it's 95 year olds dying, not five year olds dying. Um, it's true. Uh, so I, I just think that we don't have enough numbers yet. I think we'll have that in the next six to 12 months as more people get vaccinated to see, are we seeing less MISC or uh, miscellaneous inflammatory symptoms of children or less myocarditis in young, young patients? We just don't know yet. That, well, it was, cardio, uh, it was both death and cardiovascular death. It depends on if you look at primary or secondary endpoints, but yes. The, 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 the MACE events uh, are better with uh, clopidogrel rather than aspirin. Do you, what, do, you, do you recommend more restrictions in your patients that are on aspirin than are on platelets? Nope, the neither. I tell patients who are on dual antiplatelet therapy or any anticoagulant, if you're doing an activity in which someone reasonably wears a helmet, you have to wear a helmet. That's what I restrict them to. And I tell them not to base jump. That's about it. Other, yeah. Uh, for primary prevention, oh, I'm trying to think of which trials. Emperor, Emperor did have uh, a pretty good number of, of primary prevention, so yes. Yeah. 
Uh, a lot of their trials have been secondary prevention as they started with all the heart failure and CKD patients with, but the, the newest EMPEROR trial had uh, primary prevention patients in it. Yeah. I would defer to the PCP, and I think that's, as I mentioned, I think that you're going to have to really have a good communication with your primary care doc that, hey, I'm putting Mrs. Smith on this. I'm going to have them follow up in the next month and make sure that they, they know about that. But I'd defer to the PCP on it. So, yep. Sure. The, so the P2Y12s of the three that are FDA approved, two of the three are generic. So clopidogrel as well as um, prasugrel, uh, uh, brand name is Effiant. Both of them are now cheap generic drugs. Berlinta or Ticagrelor is the only P2Y12 that is still branded. Um, so luckily we've got two options. The diabetes drugs I mentioned, unfortunately, are still wicked expensive. So other, yeah. It, it's hit or miss. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we worked through all of our pharmacies and we worked through all of the patient advocacies to get them paid for because they're expensive. You know, most people, if they're paying for it, it's going to run them two or three hundred bucks, which is a lot. Yeah.